morning everybody, or good afternoon I should say. My name is Louise Halfpenny and I'm welcoming you to the Stakeholder Reference Group session on clinical strategy. Hopefully you know who, who I am. I'm the Director of Communications and I'll just run through what we're going to cover today and how we're going to run the session. So we do have you all on mute just while we go through the presentations, but in a slight change this time, we are taking questions in a mix of ways. So via the chat function, as some of you have been doing for quite some time, also uh, via the raising of your hand, which you can do um, on, the, on the computer. Or if you can't make that work, I shall be looking very carefully to see for people who are actually raising their hands. So hopefully there's a range of ways for you to interact with us in this session. What I would say is we would really like the questions to be about the clinical strategy. We know there is a lot of passion about sites and locations and buildings, but this really isn't the session to talk about the bricks and mortar. We're very lucky that we've got our chief medical officer with us and also Claire Parker. So we really want to use their expertise and to ask them questions about the topics that, they're, that they really know a lot about. So that is my, my plea to you, please, to try to keep the questions very much aligned to the clinical strategy that Claire is going to talk you through. Just to introduce you to uh, Claire and, and Mike, so Claire Parker is our Director of Strategy and Integration and Mike van der Waart is our Chief Medical Officer now with uh, around 20 years experience at the Trust so it's probably a familiar figure to those of you who've been to some of our public meetings and Mike has been our Chief Medical Officer for around seven years now. So to allow you time for questions we will move on with the presentation which Claire is going to lead and then we'll stop for questions after that. Over to you Claire. Thanks Louise. So I'll just start with a bit of context for the strategy. So some of you will already be aware and may well have been involved um, in sessions where we developed as a trust our strategy um, for the overall trust back in February 2020 was it was when it was published and that describes how we want to move forward as an organization over the next five years to deliver our, our overall vision of the very best care for every patient every day. Um, and you may remember or recognize the sunny tree that we've used to describe um, what we want to achieve and how we want to get there and what some of those key planks are. Within that strategy, we have described four key aims, best care, best value, great team and great place. And the key focus for the clinical strategy is the best care element. So how we ensure our patients and their carers have a great experience of care. Clearly there is an interaction between that and the others, particularly great team, because we can't deliver great care without uh, great people. Um, but the, the, the primary focus is really on what we are going to do and how we are going to do it well. We do that in the context of lots of other things which we need to reflect. Most importantly is the NHS long-term plan uh, that again has, has been, was published um, a couple of years ago now that people will be aware of. And that sets out within it uh, some key changes to the way that the NHS delivers care that we need to respond to and deliver on. And I'll talk about that a bit more in, in a few minutes. More locally, we also have the Your Care, Your Future strategy, which we published back in 2015. And also we now work in what we call an integrated care system across Hertfordshire and West Essex. And at that wider system level, we have an integrated health and care strategy about how we help people to, uh, to, to, to be healthier and have greater health and well-being. So all of those are things that we need to make sure that our strategy is reflective of. So just moving on to the next slide, just trying to put that in context. So as I say, we have the overall trust strategy that was published back in February. And our focus for today's session is on the clinical strategy, um, which, as I say, is really talking about what it is we want to do and how we're going to do it well. That um, feeds into and informs the clinical brief for the redevelopment, but it's not the same thing. Um, and that obviously then also feeds into the site strategy. But our conversation is, is much less about 
which hospital we're delivering things in or, or which services need to be located together. It's much more about how we get the best outcomes, how we improve care um, and how we work more closely with our uh, wider system. So how we integrate with the community and with primary care to help drive better outcomes. So in terms of uh, moving on to the next slide, I mentioned the NHS long term plan and that, as I said that describes a, a new model of care that the NHS wants to deliver so, so we've really been delivering care in to a large degree the same way since the NHS was established. Um, we've seen real changes away from things like elective inpatient care towards more things delivered as day cases so there have been changes like that but to a large degree really we're, we're practicing the way that we that we have done in the past but we now have far greater challenges in terms of an aging population that we need to address so that we can really meet the needs of those people which drives more long-term conditions and therefore um, how we how we support people over a longer periods of time rather than more episodic hospital care um, and also technology now is enabling us to do things at a rate that we haven't uh, seen historically so both of those really drive us to work differently the five key changes it talks about is boosting out of hospital care so where we can deliver things in people's own homes or in the community or helping people uh, to manage their own care uh, so self-management uh, improving people's health and well-being uh, re redesigning and reducing pressure on emergency hospital services, which we know have been overheated uh, over the last few years. More personalised care that focuses on the wants and needs of the individual and how people are again enabled to take more responsibility for their care, how they're involved in decision making um, and how they can take more responsibility in a, in a more even conversation with uh, clinicians and practitioners more digitally enabled primary and outpatient care and uh, a focus on population health so that's that health and well-being element that i just mentioned within the plan there are a number of ambitions and commitments um, i'm not going to go through all of them but it looks at a number of areas such as emergency care planned care cancer and very explicitly in some cases says what's going to be different so under planned care for example Outpatient services will be fundamentally redesigned so that patients can avoid a third of first face to face outpatient appointments so that people don't need to travel for unnecessary outpatient visits. And actually our experience over the last six months where we've had to make changes as a result of, of COVID has demonstrated how we can deliver virtual consultations in a way that meets the needs of patients and um, avoids them needing to travel while still being able to access that specialist input when they really need it. Lots of ambition in the long term plan around cancer. At the moment, a lot of cancers are diagnosed very late, which obviously impacts on people's ability to survive that cancer. Um, and the long term plan is ambitious about moving from a half to a three quarters of cancer patients diagnosed at early stages, which will enable 55,000 more people per year by 2028 to survive cancer. So there's a lot of work that we need to do as a hospital to make sure um, that we're able to do that and also working very closely with our partners because a lot of that will be about uh, how we have uh, more screening processes and programmes in the community, how primary care is better at recognising cancer, how we encourage people to, to come forward um, at an earlier stage by increasing their understanding of what the symptoms of cancer might be. So again, that feeds into not just us as an organisation, but how we work more widely in the system to improve some of those outcomes for people. So moving on, uh, other areas where there are commitments around maternity and how we improve maternal health and reduce stillbirths, um, how we personalise care more um, and how we support people in care homes, which again has, has been something that we've really had to focus on during the last six months. So moving on, um, so far in the last three or four months, we've been having conversations primarily in internally with our staff, but also talking to some of our partner organisations, such as the Mental Health Trust, the community provider and our primary care uh, colleagues to think about what are the key themes we would want to see included in the clinical strategy. 
And some of the ones that have come up so far is that we need to learn from the experience of the last six months as we've responded to COVID. There's been uh, a lot of very difficult challenges for our staff and uh, for patients during the period. But there's also been a great leap forward in the way that we've delivered care in some areas that have really driven um, improvements and are things we would want to adopt longer term. Um, and I'm sure Mike could give some examples of those later if people are interested. Um, we are really keen to be able to be clear about where we already have or would want to develop areas of excellence. So we know that a lot of people have to travel into London at the moment to access some of the more specialist parts of care. And there are some of those things that we could do well internally, which would allow people to access them closer to home. So that's something we really want to drive and focus on over the next few years. We've learned during COVID, as I say, that we can deliver more care virtually or in the community or in people's homes, which means that we can stop people having to travel just to access expertise. So if people now need to come to our hospital sites, that should be because they need to use the facilities available there, not just because they need to get the expertise of one of our clinicians. Um, so that should hopefully uh, reduce the time that we waste for patients and, and show how we value people's time more. We want to integrate more, both within the hospital, between the different services in the hospital, so that if you do need to see two or three different consultants because of the, the uh, health conditions that you have, that we find ways of doing that in a more joined up way to, um, again, to better value your time and so that that care is more, more joined up and integrated for you. But also how we integrate into the community and with primary care and social care so that pathways are much more joined up and there's less uh, you let, notice it less when you move between different providers because it all feels more joined up and focused around you as a, as a service user uh, we want to personalize care more which i've spoken about and have more digital solutions um, using the technology that's more and more available to us we want to create new roles. We're aware that there are a number of areas where historically we've struggled to recruit, but that actually creating new roles will help to both fill those gaps and attract more people into our organisation. And that will again enable us to deliver more better care. Um, so that's a, a big focus. And we know that more and more healthcare is driven by diagnostics and we need to expand the, uh, the number and potentially the range of diagnostics that we have available so that we can um, Better, uh, better meet the needs of people around diagnostics. We're developing the strategy using this framework. So our overarching aim is best care, and we want to be able to describe high quality services with areas of excellence. And the way we want to deliver those is to be working in partnership around new care models that have greater em emphasis on integration, personalization, and also consistent care, so that um, you doesn't matter who you see or what time of day you come, the, the care you receive for a particular condition will be consistent. And that will be clinically led and enabled by some supporting strategies around digital, our people, diagnostics, and also how we redesign business processes because we are aware that often the actual care that people receive is really excellent, but the experience of that care is not so good. And we let ourselves down on things like how we communicate and the letters that people receive. Um, and so we really want to get that right as well so that the experience is as good as the care that we deliver. So under each of those different areas, we want to set some ambitions um, and these are still being developed. So, you know, we're looking for feedback on these and I'm sure that the, the actual precise wording will change. But we want to have a, an ambition about how we provide best care, an ambition about how we integrate our pathways to improve outcomes, an ambition around how we personalise the care to take account of the goals of the individual, and an ambition around how we standardise care to get consistent outcomes, efficient pathways um, that are, are structured around our patients. We also will have some supporting ambitions against each of those four areas I mentioned. So how we use digital to enable effective service delivery, how we have diagnostics um, that, that support our, the way we deliver care, how we support and develop our staff, and how we redesign business processes. 
And all of those ambitions will be backed up by some very clear, measurable objectives and outcomes so that you can see whether we are actually delivering those things that we said we want to deliver. So in a moment, we're going to move on to um, a question and answer session where we want to get your views and inputs into the strategy so far. But I think before I do that, I'll just like to hand over to Mike, um, who as Chief Medical Officer is sponsoring the clinical strategy and strongly driving and leading this internally um, so that he can just give his, his views and flavour um, for you. Thanks, Claire. So yeah, you know, we've got a really exciting opportunity here. Um, you know, we've got the hospital redevelopment. We are becoming digitally mature, um, and that was obviously fast tracked with the whole COVID experience. You know, to give an example, the ambition was to have seventy five percent of consultations happening virtually in about five years' time. I think at the trust at the moment, it's about ninety five percent first consultations are done virtually. Uh, we have changed the way we deliver care in the emergency department by actually having uh, specialist consultants from different specialities actually embedded in the ED department and are now using a virtual platform to expand that, that degree of, of uh, decision makers at the front door. Um, and obviously working with our patients in that examining the, path, the pathway through the hospital, how we can make it the most efficient uh, and best experience for our patients and ensuring the best outcome. With regards to standardization of care, we've got a number of um, projects in place already. Um, we call them the CPGs, and essentially, uh, which are clinical pathway groups, um, where you know the best, you get the subject matter experts to decide what is the very best way to manage a certain condition. And then you put that down as a protocol. Now it's not it's not set in stone because otherwise you don't learn. Um, so if a a clinician wants to deviate from the pathway, he may do so, but then just needs to say why. And then we can, by continually auditing our outcomes, actually see perhaps that clinician has got a better pathway. In which case you change the pathway, or if the outcomes are not as good, then you you gently encourage them to to fall into place and to follow the, the agreed pathway. So these lots of innovation and learning and what we call QI, quality improvements occurring within the trust. Um, and this all needs to feed into our strategy now as to, you know, you only come to the hospital when you need the hospital facilities, as Claire alluded to, you have easy access to subject matter experts and wherever possible, we deliver care in the community. Thanks. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Claire. So, um, just uh, waiting for some questions to come in now. Um, just to remind you, the questions that, well, uh, Claire has set out a couple of questions there. So we are particularly um, keen to uh, get your views on whether you think um, that the integrated care, personal care, consistent care are really what we should be aiming for and do you think those are the right ambitions? Is there anything missing in what you've heard from Claire and what you've heard from Mike? So we're really interested in your views on that. Um, we know that some of you are not fully, well, perhaps not you because you're here with us on Zoom, but we know that you have concerns about people who are not comfortable with digital technology. And we would, I would repeat what we've said before, which is that, we will always work with patients to understand what method they want to be communicated by. We're on the verge of some exciting planning around an electronic patient record. And this record will flag up the communication needs of the patient in a way that uh, we don't yet have. And that will help us understand if it is a patient who needs to be contacted by phone or letter or somebody who absolutely really does need a physical appointment to see uh, a doctor or a clinician in person. So we do give that assurance despite the galloping pace of everything digital, we will still make allowances for people who don't wish to communicate with us in that way. Um, and there was another point that's, being, that's uh, been raised, which is about diagnostic services and that they should be available to GPs. So Mike, if it's all right with you, I'd like you to um, give us a flavour of what diagnostic processes um, that 
could go out to GPs or could be available in community settings. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's so obviously this is a very rapidly developing field and tests that in the past were sort of restricted to consultant only request or speciality only request has really broadened out. So, you know, we really do have ultrasound in the community. Uh, we have echoes in the community. When you start talking about things like CT scanners and MRI scanners, they obviously are they, they're big money items, but that doesn't mean that you can't have them in the community. Rather than having them all centralized on a single site, you can have the scanners uh, dotted around. It's not going to, you know, provided they, you know, affordable and what have you. But by having a proper digital network, you don't have to have the reporting radiologists scattered around. They can be centralized and the data is then sent through to them. Clearly, we, what we need to manage, however, is that there is a, a, a proper governance structure in place that we don't overutilize those facilities uh, and thus delay um, imaging for people who really need it and need it fairly quickly. Um, same thing as, you know, even simple things like blood tests. Most of the blood tests at the moment are done within the hospital environment, which is, which is crazy. You know, we should have community hubs uh, throughout the, our area where patients can go along, have their blood tests done um, conveniently and close to the home and then send the blood samples through rather than sending the poor patients all the way through to the hospital to get them done. So we're going through all the different phases of diagnostics and actually, you know, it's, there is a, a, a capital side to it, you know, what can we afford because it's not just the machine, it's the surrounding structures that you have to put in place. So you can't have an MRI scanner on the in every neighborhood, but you may well be able to have, you know, localities where you would put those facilities in. And the more simpler uh, diagnostics, you know, could very easily be in uh, community centers or even in GP practices, depending on the demand and, and, and capacity that we have. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Um, and just just to remind uh, you out there, if you can't find the chat function, um, and raise your hand on the computer. I am sort of doing a, a scan of, of you all. So if you are raising your hand in person, I hope also to be able to see you um, that way. So just to see if we have any more questions that have, that have come in. Um, yes, uh, Joan, did you want to ask, answer, ask your question in person? Or are you happy for me to ask it for you? I, I take that as a nod and uh, Joan says um, that you can't always diagnose over the phone or on a screen. So I wonder, Mike, if I could ask you to, to pick up uh, that question, please. Yeah, sure. I absolutely agree on that. And, you know, there is um, uh, obviously the necessity to, uh, to see people in person. However, a lot of conditions um, can be diagnosed uh, virtually. And I'll give an example as to how uh, telephone consultations can improve the overall throughput of things. So I'm a cardiologist by background. And if you take even a year ago, if I got a referral letter saying, you know, Mrs. Jones is having palpitations, uh, can you please see her? Uh, in order to try and reduce the number of outpatient appointments that that patient had, <clears throat> we would get a scan of her heart and a 24-hour ECG before we even saw her. Um, and then you'd see the patient and actually find that it didn't really have palpitations at all. Whereas now we get the referral, we phone the patient, get a better history than what the GP is able to do in the limited time that he has available, and then make a far more uh, informed decision as to what tests are required and whether you need to see the patient in person or whether you can continue to do this virtually. The net result of that is already we've seen with regards echocardiograms, there's been a 75% reduction in the number of echoes that are being requested, which means that those patients who do need an echo are getting it quicker. Excellent. Okay, so that, that, that there is um, a sort of kind of growing body of evidence that it, that it does work. But I think I would come back to my previous point, Joan, and that if we have people who feel that they can't get what they need out of a digital appointment then we would look to um to make an arrangement for them um i, mean, I might just just also yes, add of course to, to what mike said so we're very conscious that there are some um 
some particular patients that will, will never be appropriate for phone and need to be seen face to face and that the proportion of that definitely varies by specialty so some specialties by their very nature will need to see people face to face more often other specialties that will be less important so one of the things we've been doing over the, the last couple of months is for each specialty to do some work explicitly looking at when is it appropriate to use virtual when is it not appropriate and and therefore um, how do we best target Target it so that we do make sure that people who need face-to-face -face, where that's clinically appropriate or as you say where where they can't access digital are able to do so okay lovely thank you um, and we have a question from Rosie here um, we can't see uh, Rosie on the on the screen so I will just go to her question which is well a comment or first which is that the use of NDT is a really good way forward and that is a multidisciplinary team and I think um, Mike I'd like you to explain how an MDT works because it is something that can work really well digitally and then also a little bit about um, patient notes and what you think the future might be of um, being able to record into electronic notes and how you think um, the electronic patient record will change things so really just a couple of acronyms for you to decode for us, MDT and EPR, if you would, please, Mike. Okay, so an MDT or multidisciplinary team meeting is where you are, uh, typically it's when you're deciding what treatment a patient should receive. Um, they started off predominantly in cancer um, treatments uh, and also in cardiology, in cardiac surgery, but now it's become pretty much standard practice throughout the NHS when you're looking at elective work. Occasionally used in emergencies uh, when you've got a difficult problem and you want to have a, a discussion. But MDTs, it's a, it's a formal meeting that's held typically every week. And the um, attending uh, medical team will present the data. Um, so the patient's background, what their, um, what their comorbidities or other medical conditions are, the diagnostic uh, tests, the imaging, etc. And then you have a discussion as to what the best treatment that the clinicians feel uh, should uh, be offered to the patient. Once you've come to that, you then obviously then have a further discussion with the patient to get their agreement and insights and further questions, because sometimes you have a couple of options that you could have, um, and you then make a, a collective decision. So that's been, it's what it does, it standardizes approach um, and essentially gives the patient multiple second opinions uh, at a single sitting so it's not just what I think a patient should get it's what all my colleagues feel is the best way forward electronic patient record um, is is coming and it's coming soon so basically a paperless hospital so all the data will be stored electronically and it also gives you the advantage that you can get all the imaging uh, or the blood results, uh, previous history, um, at, the, at a click of a button. Furthermore, it allows us then to improve the standardization of care or to re reduce unwarranted variation uh, by what I was alluding to earlier on with regards to the CPG work. So simple example would be, you know, somebody comes along, they've got uh, an ear infection, the, you know, they've clicked the button that yes, it is an ear infection, the, the system will then prompt you to say, well, actually, the recommended treatment is X antibiotic at such a dose for so many days. Um, now, you can click yes, and the prescription will be automatically sent, uh, done for you. Or you can say no, um, and, and then put an antibody that you want to give, but then you have to give a reason, say, well, why aren't you following the protocol? So generally, the, the hospitals that have done a huge amount of this kind of work are in America, particularly in Utah. Um, and they've been running this kind of thing for about 20 years or so. Um, and by having that option to deviate or to follow, they've actually, some of the protocols, they've changed 59 times uh, over the 20 years to improve the outcomes. And what is interesting, particularly in the American context, is that that uh, hospital system consistently develops, uh, delivers the best results across the whole of the USA with regards to health outcomes and are the cheapest. 
I might just add, Louise, from a, from a slightly different angle. So, so one of the things that I also lead on is um, our integrated care partnership with, other, uh, with the other providers in our area. Um, one of the things that having an electronic patient record will enable us to do is to then be able to talk to the other electronic systems that people are using. So the system that primary care uses, the system that they use in the community, so that when somebody is sitting in front of any, anybody in any setting, that clinician with the permission of the patient will be able to access the records um, and therefore look at the totality of, of their interventions and, and the conversations they've had with, with health and social care, which of course will therefore actually enable that, that care to be delivered more effectively. And um, what other areas have managed to do and which um, we would be aiming to do at, at as well once um, we've got some of that interconnected interoperability uh, available is to also make sure that that record is available to the patient because it is at the end of the day the patient's record. Um, and so we would also be looking to make sure that people can see their own record and what it says about them um, and to be able to use that as well to help them to self-manage and manage their own care. Okay, great. Thank you, Claire. And uh, there's another question and a, a comment really about um, really on the topic of integration, because obviously we work with a lot of a lot of partners. And some of you will know that um, various aspects of physiotherapy have been carried out by a different organisation in the previous, uh, well, cu currently and in the uh, change made fairly recently. And I think Joan we can unmute you. So um, if we can just unmute Joan, she has a question about MSK. So can you um, can you go ahead, Joan? Let's just check that you're unmuted. You should be able to unmute yourself. Brilliant. Off you go. OK. Um, the GPs at the moment, if you present with what appears to be an MSK problem, have to send you to Connect, which is the MSK service. And you get a couple of triages and you may or may not see somebody. But recently I've had three friends of mine with various, one was a hip from running and they thought it was a sore hip, you know, overrunning elderly gentleman, and two with back aches. And all three of them have actually eventually been diagnosed with cancers. Um, two of them have since died because they weren't treated quickly enough. The other one finished up having a hip replacement because she fell over anyway and they cut out part of the cancer when she had her hip replacement. So much as they didn't expect her to be alive today, she actually is. But my problem is any, if you go to the GP with any MSK problem, you have to go via Connect before you can get anything done. And people are presenting with back aches, with leg aches and all sorts of things which appear to be MSK problems, but they're actually not. It's a comment. Um, I'm thank you, Joan. Myself now. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it is a comment, but I'm sure it's something that uh, Mike, our, our chief medical officer, would like to come in on. Mike, over to you, please. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I think this um, really shows what the importance of an integrated uh, uh, process is, where you actually have an agreed pathway with regards backache or hip pains and that sort of thing, because obviously the vast majority of them are just musculoskeletal things. But we need to have a, a safety net built into that. Um, and that's why these, the CPGs are so important that we sit and we liaise with our primary care colleagues as to say, right, if somebody presents with backache, are there any, what we call a red flag, are there anything in the, in the history that really worries you that that's not you know, the normal sort of symptom? And equally, you know, um, we need to make sure that the pathway is efficient. From what you're describing, they're going through multiple consultations without actually being seen. And clearly, COVID would have had an effect on that. And as we slowly emerge from this, you know, we'll have obviously a lot more hands-on. And it is one of the specialities where you do need to have hands-on. And I was speaking to one of my spinal surgeons, and he was saying, you know, I can do all the imaging and all that kind of stuff, but actually I do need to examine the patient. I can't see how far they can bend their leg and stretch their spine, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's the important where we can have these, these defined pathways that are agreed across the, the, the whole system. It's, so it's not just the hospital decision or the primary care physician. It's an agreed ap approach to all the different symptom, you know, well, frequent, frequently occurring symptoms. 
um, so that we can improve that standardization of care. You know, I'm very sad to hear what's happened to your friends, and I'm, it wouldn't surprise me that COVID probably had some influence in it, because as you know, at one stage, you know, we were not seeing any uh, routine outpatient referrals, uh, and even to, you know, although that has now restarted, we still are restricted to an extent. Uh, Mike, these were pre-COVID at the end of last year, and the big problem was the GPs were not allowed to send the patients for a scan or for an x-ray. They had to have the scans or the x-rays via the physiotherapy service. So, so Jane, with your permission, I'll take that back to the CCG because I, I, I don't know the specifics of this, so I, I can't comment on the specifics. But in my previous experience with these types of community pathways, there are normally exceptions for two week weight cancer pathways. So I'll, if you're happy, I'll take this back to them as to to understand what should have happened in that situation and whether there are those safeguards in place that, that Mike was referring to. They weren't suspected of cancer at the time. It came as a shock to absolutely everyone. They just saw one just had it from running. One always had a backache, so just a backache again. There was no, you know, suspicious anything else is. But if the GP could have been able to do a scan or an X-ray, maybe their paths would have been slightly different. And this was pre-COVID. Thank you, Joan. So Deepa, we're coming to you next. You should be able to unmute yourself and you've also got a, a, a question about integration and technology, I believe. So off you go. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I had a quick question regarding um, prescriptions and I know that the prescriptions I think are from, like there's a link up with like your GP to the pharmacy that you have. If everything's gonna be going online, does that mean the people, our GPs, will also be able to access that information and then pass that on to people that might need prescriptions if they have invisible disabilities? Because with the invisible disabilities, you're not really able, obviously they're invisible. Um, and I'm just wondering if there's a flare up, for instance, will there be an easier process in linking those two systems up so you don't have to constantly talk to your GP to get that medication? Um, and if they, if that's possible or not. Good question. Mike, do you want to start? And then maybe Claire will come in on that one. Yeah, so I'm not an IT expert, but yes, I mean, that is part of the whole um, IT strategy that we have, is that we have a seamless interaction between primary community and the hospital settings from the IT point of view. Thank you. And, and Claire, anything that you might want to add about yeah. um, ability to see different different records and yeah. um, help patients? Yeah, so so I'm, so this isn't my area of expertise at, at all. So, you know, taking what I, I say in, in that context, um, I suppose a couple of a couple of things sort of, sort of come to mind. So, so certainly we're, we're definitely talking about how we do electronic prescribing in the trust and, and how that links forward and, and the, the, the different linkages. I, I think that the experience of some people during COVID has been that it has been easier to access repeat prescriptions from their practice because there are now virtual ways to do that through each consultation that has actually speeded that process up. So, so that may not be a universal experience, but I know that some people have anecdotally said that that, that has made life easier. Um, the other thing that may or may not be appropriate, and like I said, this is where I'm not an expert, is that one of the things we're looking at internally is what we call patient initiated follow up. So where people have got long term conditions rather than routinely coming back to the trust every three or six months when they may not be having particular issues um, for those patients who are confident to do so we would make that patient initiated so that if, you, if something was going on and actually needed to get some input from a, from a specialist, it would be much easier to do that at the point in time when it was needed. So I wonder whether a combination of some of the patient initiated follow up, the, the linkages of the systems and practices, you know, now being able to, to request prescriptions via um, e-consultations and getting those moving more quickly might help address some of those issues that you've raised. Thank you, Claire. Um, sorry, I was interrupted uh, by somebody coming to my office. So sorry about that, everyone. Um, Helen, I think you have a, a question, so we should be able to unmute you. Um, do you want to go ahead? Sometimes it takes a couple of seconds. I was going to say that through your pharmacy, if you contact your pharmacy, 
they can go through to your GP to um, give repeat prescriptions of drugs, things that you've used in the past, and vice versa. So you don't need to um, constantly keep coming back to the consultant. That's already in place. That's all I was going to say. It wasn't really a question. And, I, and, and also what Joan was saying, I agree that the way we're doing the services now prolongs the time that you get to get to see a consultant in the first instance. And um, it adds, I would say, a couple of months on unnecessarily so when a GP could send you to a consultant at a hospital and it was arranged with the hospital to make an appointment, which, which for me, having experienced it a lot, is a far better way of doing it. Thank you, Helen. Um, at the risk of making myself deeply unpopular with Mike, um, I suppose I might, I might play devil's advocate and say there are um, sometimes other clinicians who can deal with a range of issues. And um, but I think that's why that, that those kind of services were set up like that. But, but Mike, you, you might have a comment on that and, it, and you might have a view that there may be other ways on the horizon that we don't know about that do speed things up for patients. Yeah, so I mean, the important thing is to have an agreed protocol or agreed pathway. So patients who are presenting with musculoskeletal things a lot of the time don't need a consultant, but obviously sometimes they do. And it's, it's, it's designing the pathway that, you know, the, you know, common things occur commonly and usually can be dealt with fairly simply. And that's what you don't want coming to the hospital if they don't actually need to come to the hospital. What you do need is those people who do need to come to the hospital can come to the hospital earlier than what they can rather than through if everyone's coming through. So it's the design of those pathways that are absolutely vital. And I think to be honest, with because of virtual consultations, I think it may become easier now to get a specialist opinion uh, than before because you know a lot of the initial workup can occur in the community and then you present that package so to speak to the specialist involved who can then make a decision about face-to-face -face consultations further investigations or treatment it is an evolving uh thing and i think the other important thing is that you know in the past you had uh the commissioners deciding on the pathways who got referred who didn't get referred i think it was an integrated care pathway or integrated care system um, you know, there'll be more collective ownership of, of these sort of issues that we have, and we can hopefully improve, uh, design a far better pathway, both from a patient's point of view, but also for, as, as a healthcare system. Thank you. Uh, Colin, we can see you on the beach. Um, we, like, we like your backdrop there. Did you want to ask a question yourself? You had a question on EPR and um, how accessible it is for other people outside the trust. I, I think I'm taking that, that you, you trust me to, to ask it for you. So just so I've got it, got the wording just right. Colin asks, are patient records accessible outside the trust? And yes. will EPR be available outside the trust? So um, Claire, if I can go to you first and then bring in Mike if he has any other queries. So, so the quick answer is not yes, but the, not yet, but they will be. So um, until we get the EPR functioning within the hospital, then we won't be able to make that available outside of the hospital. But certainly the absolute intention is to be able to join up the trust's EPR and the trust patient records with those patient records in primary and community care so that they can be accessed anywhere um, with appropriate patient permissions. Thank you. Um, and Mike, did you have anything else to add on, on EPR? It is, it is um, a really good news story for us. Obviously, it takes a long time, but we are really uh, moving on with the planning. So it's very important for us that we do have an electronic patient record and we're able to work with another trust to speed us up a little bit. So that's, that's really good news for us. Um, I think I have a... Um, Another, just another thing to say to the group is that we will, as a result of this session, 
follow up with some questions for you. So as we, as we did when we were asking you for input into our critical success factors and our investment objectives, we will go over the, the content of this presentation and ask a couple of, of questions and would be very grateful if you could feed in by email because you know we're, we're really moving ahead with this and the redevelopment so we need to take you with us uh, and so your views on the clinical strategy would be very much appreciated so we look out for that in your inboxes um, I also just wanted to say one thing about the board meeting in fact it's a boards meeting a meeting of boards on Thursday the 1st of October and at this meeting there is an opportunity for you to make a representation which you can do either in writing or in person and when I say in person I mean like this and the way that you let us know that is the usual West Hearts redevelopment email but you do need to let us know by midday tomorrow please and if there are, is a fleet of people who want to make representations in person we will just have to look at um, who they are, what they might want to say, just to see if a couple of, of people might sort of work together. But we're going to try and allow as much time as possible. And certainly also we will accept written representations, which will be part of our board papers. So the boards of this organisation and Hearts Valley's Clinical Commissioning Group will look at those and they will consider them when they make their decisions on the proposed shortlist, which will happen on Thursday, the 1st of October. So um, just looking to see if I've got any questions or any people either waving at me or raising their hands. And I can't see, oh, I can see that Kenneth um, wants to ask a question. So if we can just make sure that Kenneth can be unmuted. And if you can do that, Kenneth, um, yourself, you should be able to unmute yourself and ask us your question. Yes, Great, yes, off I, you go. Actually, as a governor for six years, my job sometimes was to do, to do ward rounds of patients. And I found patients' greatest concern was communication. And I suggest that perhaps uh, junior doctors especially could be educated in-house, uh, in, in the lecture theater on how best or how to improve their communications to patients to avoid their concerns. Thank you, thank you, Kenneth. Well, it just so happens that we've got the Chief Medical Officer here. So Mike, did you, you're familiar with that, I think, from, it's a common theme in, in complaints, isn't it? But perhaps you could say something about work we're doing with our juniors. Yeah, it, it is indeed. I mean, uh, probably 75% of the complaints actually are down to communication in, in the end. Um, I absolutely agree, but I, I, I take a slightly different strategy. Um, clearly in the COVID era, it's difficult to have it in the lecture theatre. I think it's better to teach by example in that situation. And we do have consultant delivered care uh, across the trust. So every patient gets seen by a consultant every day of the week. And in some of the specialities, um, it's just the working week. Others, it's 7-7. It's seven, seven. And to actually show by example how to talk to patients and the most important question when you're doing a ward run is when you finish seeing the patient is to ask them do you understand what's going on do you have any questions um you know that was in the old days you know the nurse would stay behind and answer those questions but what is really important now is to actually do it there and then one of the initiatives we are trialing in the trust at the moment which i hope is going to improve things even further is that the admission summary, what used to be called the discharge summary, is finalized at the bedside and signed off by either the consultant or the registrar in the presence of the patient, so that you actually have an agreed management plan from when they go home. And I think that's gonna absolutely change things fundamentally, uh, rather than what historically has happened as a rather junior member of the team would do that summary and put in the, you know, the review dates and that kind of thing. So. We've trialing that in one of the wards at the moment. We're getting the software organized that we can have a laptop accompanying the team there. Um, and I think it's going to you know, significantly reduce these communication issues. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. 
Thank you, Kenneth. And David, David Thorpe, did you want to introduce yourself to the group? And yes, certainly. You have a question for us. Thank you. No, thank you very much. It's just adding to uh, Mike's um, discussion about communication. So I'm David Thorpe, Deputy Chief Nurse. I just wanted to um, give you some information about how we communicate with our patients in combination with our medical colleagues. And I think it's really important to just understand that we have regular ward managers, sisters who go around the wards discussing their care with patients. But also, as a multidisciplinary team, we have board rounds which we discuss all patients' care. From those particular board rounds, it is both the medical teams and the nursing teams to put people um, and informed uh, and informed. So it's very much about communication. So it's again going back and saying, This is your care for today. These are our plans going forward. So what I'm finding is there's more informed decisions being made, there's more communication with our patients. And I think, however difficult those conversations are, it's about keeping our patients safe. And by being more informed and giving this information, it's really vital. So working with Mike and his team and working with the nursing profession to keep uh, our patients more informed is, is better all round. So I just wanted to give you a snippet of what we're trying to do constantly. Thank you. Thank you, David. Good to have you with us. And uh, Joan, you've got a follow-up question, I, I think, to that. So if you can just make sure that... Uh, Joan is un unmuted. Off you go, Joan. Yeah, it was to do with discharge. My, I'm delighted to hear about the discharge letters because I have more complaints through the patients about their discharges and discharge letters than anything. It's very important, though, that with a lot of the people, they have somebody from their family or somebody that they know with them because not all of them will take in what you're actually saying. I mean, some of them are being discharged and they're still not 100% well, and some of them don't understand anyway. And I always tell the people that I know, make sure somebody is with the patient when the discharge summary is being done and read through. So, yeah, I, I mean, we're, we're feasible. You know, that is obviously the ideal thing. However, the family can't always come in. I think one of the things that has improved things quite a lot is we now have the follow-on phone call uh, led by David and his team, and that the following, the day after patients being discharged was certainly no longer than 48 hours, a phone call is made to that patient um, so that they can, you know, are there any questions? Are you clear about what the, what the plan is? Um, and, you know, that's gone on extremely well. I would uh, agree with that, Mark. I think it's really important that we put in a compassionate conversation, we call it, where we try to contact every discharge patient, as Mark has, has indicated. We don't always get through because, again, uh, hospital numbers aren't always feeding through to individual phone calls. But majority of, of, of people, we have a discussion. We may have 10 to 15 minutes, and it may be something about medication. It may be something about follow-up. But it is, it's a very much uh, work in progress, driving that forward. And I'm really, really pleased that some of the comments coming back from people are really positive about how... Uh, good it is that the hospital are contacting us the day after just to understand if there's any follow-up and sometimes it's not about anything just saying actually how are you doing and now that is going down really well so that's why we class it as that compassionate conversation just to say yeah there may be nothing but we just want to see how you're doing thank you very much for that it's appreciated thank, thank you thank you david for mentioning that because i know it's something that's had really positive feedback from people who have been called and it's nice to uh, share with you today that some of the add-ons, some of the above and beyond things that we really try to do and they do make a lot of difference to people so really good to be reminded of that particularly you know when we're hearing about uh, you know COVID and patients waiting you know it's it's always nice to hear that good, good things happen and we keep on going trying to provide the best care that we can. I think also I think also try to add to that conversation is we are trying to work uh, with our patients and families with a family liaison line where we can uh, get information back and forward uh, and we're trying to invest uh, more into that because of the challenge we have at this time with visiting. So we are trying to work on some solutions to keep families and patients more informed. Thank you, David. Yes, it has been, it has been um, good to get that up and running. And we've had some fantastic 
volunteer help as well to make sure that messages get to and from patients. Now I can see that Helen you have your hand up so we'll make sure that Helen is unmuted um, and we've just got a few minutes left so over to you Helen. Yes I just wanted to say that a lot of patients certainly the elderly when after they've left hospital they go back to the drugs they were given before they went in hospital and do not take the new drugs that the consultant has advised the patients that they should have. And I wonder whether we can make sure that it's explained to the patient why their drugs are being changed because that builds in a lot of confusion, certainly for the elderly. And I know um, many, many people do not go back and take the drugs they've been given while they're in hospital. So it's Thank something you. that needs to be dealt with. Thank you, Helen. Is that anything that you could comment on, Mike? Making sure that prescriptions given by specialists here are, are that, that patients continue to take those drugs once they've been dis discharged? Yeah, I mean, I must say, I, that hasn't been my experience, but I mean, clearly, you know, things are not universal. I th it's, it is part of that whole discharge chat. And I, I mean, perhaps this new approach that we're having with the consultant signing off the discharge at the bedside may improve that further. Um, and David, perhaps it's something we could look at with the compassionate call is just to make sure that we are tying up the prescription that's been sent home with what the patient's actually taking. It could be just I an think, additional, additional question to put into that. I think that's, uh, that's absolutely fine. And that, again, that compassionate conversation is about, of course, medication. Are you, are you familiar with it, et cetera? But I think uh, for myself, uh, from the nursing profession and working with Mike and colleagues, I think that's something that we could try to reaffirm even more. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, David. And thank you to Mike and Clara. And thank you to everyone who's, who's joined us. We do appreciate the, the time that you're giving us. And we would appreciate a little bit more time, if you don't mind me asking, when we send you an email with a couple of questions about the clinical strategy. And also just a reminder that if you want to make a representation at our meeting of both boards, on Thursday the 1st of October, please get in touch with the West Hearts redevelopment email address. So thank you everyone and we'll see you again soon. Bye bye.